Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of our uh, scalable game design uh, stream. I was going to say podcast, but this is totally, totally not a podcast. Uh, I'm Eric Jacobs. I'm the host here, leading this merry band of rabble rousers and full stack developers. I guess we all decided we were. Um, so today we've got Derek Reese. Hey, hey. Uh, who unfortunately had to pull an all-nighter, so he's, he's a little under the weather. We've got Roger Keeley. Hey, folks. Kylie? Kylie. Kylie. I butcher that all the time. I apologize. I will commit it to memory now. Okay. Jared? Sprague? Sprague? Yeah, Sprague. Okay, Hello. Starting to get these right. And Michael Clayton. Hello. I've got the sound so, of roofers ringing in my ears, so please forgive me. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, roofers. Um, so today, we, we've made a ton of progress since the break. We skipped a month um, because we wanted to make lots of progress. And so today, um, we've got an interesting agenda. We're going to start with Roddy, and he's going to talk about um, AMQP and Stomp and all things messaging, and then sort of give a little bit of a high-level tour of some of the rip and replace we did to change from Stomp to AMQP on the server side. And then we made a super, I made a super hack job of a prototype of the web client that Jared then turned into a much prettier version that actually is something that humans can develop on uh, and not fat fingered, ham fisted people like me. Uh, so he's gonna show that off. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about um, actual game designy stuff. So now that we have sort of a play field and players we need to start thinking about like, how big should the play field be? And where should we put the players? You know, clearly if people are shooting each other, they shouldn't start right on top of one another. Or maybe they should, I don't know, we'll talk about it. So <laughs> that being said, Roddy, I'm, I'm gonna kind of make it your show a little bit only in the sense of uh, share your screen, do your thing, your uh, sure. um, charge here. So yeah, so looking back at how we got here, uh, we took basically something that was how a proof of concept uh, off to a good start. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just mumbling under my breath. How did we get here? Oh, um, how so, did we? How yeah, did we get here? We're all here today. <laughs> so we had a bunch of code that came in from like 2012 era, um, and it was based on Stomp so that we could communicate into the browser um, and then using a payload of essentially Google protocol buffers, right? So basically WebSocket on the browser side using Stomp, which is a simple text-oriented messaging protocol. I think that's what STOMP stands for. I was just about to ask you. Yeah, yeah, it's really really simple, right? Um, Uh, Like, I mean, you could open up Telnet and talk STOMP, really. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, the goal there was to talk to like a C++ backend and have talk through WebSocket into a browser. And at the time, it was through like um, through Flash using the old Netscape API um, in the browser. So since then, now we have uh, the, like Eric said, we have a JavaScript-based um, web client that Jared just basically put some nice structure around using NPM plus the knowledge in his head to actually structure it properly. Um, and then we here today wanted to be doing more modern things, moving into an open shift deployment, that type of thing. And so if we look at what Stomp is as a protocol, it's a, an implementation of the JMS API. And so JMS was, you know, Java messaging system or something like that. And that is very much a middleware oriented protocol. So looking forward, we wanted to be using AMQP. Now, if I can find where the chat is on the Twitch screen um, or actually in the Discord is probably a great place to drop it. Oh yeah, I should even maybe put a link to the Discord. Yeah, that'd be good. So we wanted to start using this AMQP thing because we here at Red Hat believe in open standards um, and, a, and an open, fully internationally recognized standard is better than a de facto standard. So AMQP is actually a full standard. Let's see if I can find the right links. First, it started out at Oasis. Um, I'll just drop the link into the Discord channel here. Okay, I will put it back into the restream chat. Okay, perfect. And as well, we can see that later on, basically over the course of a couple of years, it was fully standardized through working groups and committees um, into AMQP 1.0, which is an ISO standard uh, 19464-2014, all fully available um, with regards to the standard. And if you want to understand how the, the gory details works. 
So one of the important things there is that it actually fully defines how the data looks on the wire and it defines a type system. So Stomp didn't really define how the data looked on the wire. And if you were using like a previous message broker, like the original ActiveMQ classic, the data on the wire in different broker implementations was actually different. So even though all message brokers may have been JMS API spec compliant, the API was the same, but what happened on the wire was different. So ActiveMQ had this thing called OpenWire, which was basically the definition of how the data looked in binary going across the wire, right? Whereas AMQP includes that in the specification. So not only is it the protocol and the API and the behavior, it is also what the, the type system and the data that looks like on the wire. Now, of course, that being said, we sidestep a little bit of that because we use Google protocol buffers as the payload in the data section for the AMQP messages, right? And one of the reasons that, well, we had started out using protocol buffers, but I still like the idea of using protocol buffers because the message formats are not implicit. They're very explicit. And you define these .proto files that basically lay out like, this is my data. This is this particular type of message. This message contains you know, position, which is an X and Y and velocity, which is an X and Y. And the other thing the protocol buffers gives you that's really nice is the way they serialize and deserialize the data onto the wire, or in this case, into the message, uh, the, the protocol buffer message is with a variable size encoding. So if you only have an int of size eight and you set it as a variable size encoding, then you're only taking what, three bits to encode that data onto the wire. So, so obviously the amount of data we're pushing across the wire is always a big concern, yep. especially in the case of gaming, right? Like Absolutely. you wanna be able to support as many clients as possible. So the downside at the moment is that, so AMQP defines the messaging protocol and it defines the type system. And in their case, we're using Google protocol buffers as the payload. But traditionally messaging from like an enterprise standpoint, you know, enterprises like their messaging to be reliable generally, right? When, when one business function sends a message to another business function, you wanna be pretty sure it's gonna get there, right? So that- And, you may, and using, you may need to be confident that it got there. And you also may need to be confident that you can get there, right? So we, with AMQP, you have different types of settlement modes. Like you can send and wait for settlement you can send a pre-settle, which is more like a fire and forget. So we have this different types of delivery depending on the need, but ultimately we're sending over TCP, right? So AMQP is a layer above TCP and TCP is, you know, how the internet works, right? Um, well, parts of the internet. Or sometimes doesn't work, like the head of the line blocking problem that, you know, sometimes gets run into where things that had to go from, you know, here to Beijing and I'm in Eastern Canada had to pass through a lot of hops, right? And depending upon packet prioritization and any number of factors that are completely outside our control, TCP might wait, or it may take a while for the packet to get through, or the packet might disappear and the hardware at different levels decides, oh, I'm just gonna keep resending it. And the application is basically like, hey, what's going on here? I'd really like to do something, but I'm waiting for this one packet. And then that one packet disappears, then has to transmit a whole bunch again. So like, it can be a really bad thing when it comes to introducing latency, which is bad for games, right? So generally for certain types um, of games. For some types of games, that's true. Yeah. But ideally we would like to use AMK for all types of games and host all types of games on OpenShift, right? So there is some movement to utilize, for example, um, the library where we're using for the server, which is now called Cupid Proton. Uh, which is an AMQP implementation. Um, the as well. There's some move there to basically make that support not only raw TCP, which was recently implemented so that other protocols could be implemented using that library, but also UDP, meaning we hopefully in the future can do a fully ISO standard open protocol over UDP, um, which gets us closer to that, you know, mix and match of reliable UDP for games that need it versus, you know, regular TCP for something like maybe a turn-based strategy game, right? 
So I'm just going to drop some links in there just as a reference. Um, yeah, I, I, I just put the um, Cupid link in the restream, not in okay. the uh, Discord, but I will put it in the Discord now. So that's right, Cupid, so, which includes the C++ data. Yep. So what we were using is this library in the past called the CMS client for ActiveMQ. And essentially, it was called CMS because it was a C++ implementation of the JMS 1.0 API specification, right? So even though it was in C++, it was very familiar for those backend enterprise -y developers who came from Java. For, and for all the Java people that randomly got assigned to write C code, which, it felt familiar. <laughs> well, I found myself in that bucket, right? On the <laughs> for sure. Yeah, square peg in a round hole, it does happen. Yeah, right? no, for sure. Um, so, so what we've been trying to do over the last month or two is uh, basically Rip and replace CMS. Trying. We succeeded. And we did. Don't cut, don't cut yourself short. Hard and we did succeed. Correct. So I'll just, so from the back end server point of view, I'll just drop a link in here to the GitHub. Um, one of the, the main pull requests where things were almost working, but not quite, where you can see a lot of the work essentially was to like take all the references to CMS out. Um, and not only did we depend on CMS and the back end server for the messaging part, the server was kind of very, non C++ 11 uh, adherent, meaning like it, the threading model came from CMS, the new Texas came from CMS, all that kind of stuff. So it was a couple of stage process where we put in standard thread, we put in more like standard queues, we put in standard locking mechanisms. And then as well, then we ripped out the CMS messaging stuff. We put in the AMQP messaging stuff. And Adopt then as well, the then standards. we said, well, hey, we got to do this with the client too, right? Um, so on the client side, there's a very good AMQP implementation written in JavaScript uh, by a fellow messaging engineer, Gordon Sim, uh, that we basically hacked into place quickly. And then Jared did some great massaging on to get it more structured and look sensible um, called Raya. So, you know, I used, uh, I had a day, what we call a day of learning recently and I spent my day learning JavaScript and Raya uh, to kind of hack it into place. A bit outside my wheelhouse, but I have a little bit of JavaScript experience, meaning I can get in there and look at, make it look really mangled. And hopefully at the end of the yeah. day it works, right? <laughs> um, that's what happened with somebody who comes from like a static type language like C++ or C or Go jumps into JavaScript. But I think at the end of the day, I think the result uh, with, with some leadership by Eric to smooth over my mistakes and get the ball rolling there. Hardly um, leadership. Think, the blind leading a blind, sir. It could be. Um, but either way, I think I think at this point, like I'm pretty excited about it. We're in good shape. Like we went from my perspective, like I had this code sitting in the local Git server from, you know, starting in 2011, yeah, like right up years through ago. like yeah. basically 10 years ago. And I'd been maintaining it slowly over time, like getting it up once or twice a year, I'd get a chance to to poke at it and upgrade versions of the compiler yeah. and that kind of stuff. So for me, this is really exciting to have taken something that was old and didn't appear very useful anymore. If it was a proof of concept and proved something could work and to bring it kind of, to modernize something that was dusty and creaky we, and leaky a little bit. We, we just did enterprise application modernization right, right here. Go, just right? happened. Yeah. We're, just, we're gonna strangle the monolith next and do some microservice stuff. Right? <laughs> we are, we are uh, I mean, eventually, well, we're not really starting with a monolith. So I guess True. we're not really strangling one. We can avoid so. that part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we get to skip, <laughs> uh, what is it? Uh, do not, we get to pass go and collect $200? Is that, is that how yes. this monopoly game? <laughs> no, that's and super awesome. Has, yeah, and now it has some great logging that Eric found a uh, log guru library. And oh, kudos to those dudes, man. That library so, is yeah, super so awesome. That's really been do you want to really show any code? Uh, yeah, I can uh, hang on, let me share here. It's a little bit slow where there's streams going all over the place here. Uh, let me share a screen. Let me see if I can guess the right screen. It's like a... Is that is that the is that the tech nerd roulette? Is uh, guessing which which one of your displays oh, you yeah, have to share with the tool? Man. I don't oh. know, but it's on my conference call bingo card. What what share my screen or? Well, let me find the right screen to share. Yeah. Oh yeah. C line. So I think I only have one instance of C line opened up now. 
That's the UI I've been using. You're not sharing um, anything yet, though. I'm trying. Oh, okay. <laughs> so to make it already going easy. sideways. Yep. So I see that the right screen is number five. And my system really wants me to open system preferences and give permission. Okay. That okay, sounds like progress, me... I think. Oh, wait. It needs, it needs another password so I can get in to give it permission. Oh, my gosh. This is Mac OS 11, by the way. Thanks, Apple, for my privacy. I don't know. More hoops to jump through when you really need to do something. Yeah. Oh, Zoom, the OS will not be able to record until you reopen. I don't think I'm going to do that now. Quitting might be bad. <laughs> All right. But you don't need to record. That's right. I just need to share it. Oh, I can see the window in the little preview thingy now. How about, how hey, about something happened. Oh, do we have video from me? Yes, I see your screen. Oh, awesome. All right. So, um, so I guess we can go. Where do we want to go here? I don't have it set up very easily. Let's go to main. Um, oh, and essentially, you, is it possible for you to make your font bigger, or was that, that a, a huge question? There's a present mode. Yeah, when you and I tried to do that, though, it ended up on a different screen, and it was yeah, like, it jumped around and stuff. Let's see if I can do it very quickly. Appearance, that, that would be good. Uh, I don't see an easy way to. I'm, I know there's a special key combination. But I will. Keyboard, I will look for that in the background. Okay, my keyboard you you is unfortunately C lion S E A or C C as in like the native the C language. C? Yeah, like JetBrains. Uh, okay. C yeah. Line, so yeah. So essentially, um, if you had looked in here before, you would have seen like an active MQ um, initialized library statement, and in this case, we have something new here. Control plus mouse wheel. Oh, let's try that. No joy for me. Change the Maybe font size in tabs. In settings preferences, control alt s, go to appearance and behavior, appearance. In the size field, specify the font size. Hmm. I think that's what you just did though. I was trying to do. I guess it could be a little different on Mac, right? Because everything is with the command key or whatever. Uh, command alt s, command s. Command I don't know, whatever, whatever the appearance and behavior settings. Okay, hang on. View, appearance. Do I see settings, edit settings? All right, so maybe we'll show it a little closer later. Um, what I'll do, I'll go and I'll make it bigger and come back. All right. But essentially, there's just a couple of lines that we have. Oh, or you could just go to GitHub in the browser. Yeah, I could do that too. I probably won't automatically share my browser now. Let's see if we can share. Oh, God. Yeah, now. then you're going to have to. Right? Can you see an empty tab? No. Wait, I no. still see C-Line. Yeah. So what I've highlighted in blue that I can uh, I can talk more to later, maybe. There's just a couple of code, lines of code, like literally two, to get something that's called the Proton, the Proton container up and running in a thread. So essentially, we create an instance of it, and then an STD thread you know, we capture the environment and then we, um, and then we do container.run. And essentially it has this thing called the proactor and basically means that it proactively takes care of intercepting messages and then gives you callbacks you can essentially listen for on the container. And when you receive um, messages of certain types like you'll get back, not even the message, but you'll get an event from Proton that says like sender open. And then when you get a sender open, you know, like, hey, I'm good to go. I've created a sender. We're good. We can send a message now. Um, so yeah, so as that's kind of small, I will stop sharing here for the moment. And we can maybe transition over to the client and take a look there and, uh, and see what the flip side of the equation is because it takes both sides of the coin in order for us to actually have the game, like a full multiplayer game. Both the client and the server. That's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> totally overrated. I, I really, everything should just be servers. 
<laughs> well, and in some cases, you're not far off, right? The client yeah. and the server is one thing, and it exists in multiple places. Sometimes that's case. Yeah. Yeah. Context, true. Uh, Jared, do you want to yeah. share your screen? And... Yes. Let me go ahead and share. We had one, one person in the chat. Uh, who was it? Oh, Brett Toffel was like, oh, you should make a TypeScript, which will be oh, yeah, JavaScript. Yeah. And I said, oh, well, we're going to actually talk about that. <laughs> we are going to talk about that. Okay. Uh, do you see my screen then? Uh, I now see your screen. I do. Okay. All right. So first, um, just just a few um, updates about the web client. Um, the first one is this cool little rocket ship that uh, one of our... Yeah, Luke Derry. Um, yeah, one of, yeah, one of our uh, fellow uh, game devs made in about an hour after we asked for we needed one. So that was awesome. Um, but yeah, let me just okay. So first, the first thing I want to talk about is a little bit like I re-architected the the client um, to actually put some architecture around it so that we can have a sane development um, language that we talk to each other. Um, so it's this is a this is an MVC basically architecture, but it shows the uh, how the, the the client network fits fits into it. Um, so basically, we have the the client code that Roddy and Eric wrote got extracted out into its own class called the AMQP game client, and all it does is talk to the server and sync the state and send commands, pretty much. So between the server and the client, it syncs the model, um, which is the game state, and it sends commands to the server. So it's going to be bi-directional. Um, it's a game client. It's not a generic client. Be the generic client is the Rhea client that uh, Roddy mentioned earlier. The messaging client, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's, that's generic. It just sends and receives. The game client's a wrapper around that that actually has some game logic in there, like player join game and player move, like sending a move command of the player. Um, so there's a wrapper around that. Um, and uh, and so that's what it does. So that took all that stuff out and put it into that class. So it's much easier to understand. So when it syncs the model, what it does is it, it gets instantiated with a model object that the game that, that is shared across the whole game. And everything that comes from the server is just updating that model. And it is and it is a POJO. I don't know what POJO name is for JavaScript. I guess it's still POJO. Um, and- uh, Podzo? <laughs> yeah. <Office laughs> so, object? right, yeah. yeah. Right, and so, you know, it has the players, all of the players that are connected and whatever other kind of game state, that's all we have right now, pretty much is just players. But in the future, it'll have you know, other actors like enemies and objects that you can run into, asteroids, I don't know what, what all the stuff we're going to add to it, but the model will have all of that stuff in it. Um, the, mod the entire model is always on the server. We can do some optimizations in the future where, you know, only partial bits of the model get synced to the client because it could be really huge. Um, so the game, uh, so the, the game client is constantly syncing the model. Um, and then we have the controller, which is like the orchestrator. But the view takes that model and renders it pretty much. So it paints all of the players on the screen and basically the state of the world. Um, and then the controller does stuff like you know any kind of orchestrating stuff, like handling key commands that's going to have to send a command to the server via the game client. That's what that um, relationship is for. And this architecture is very, very good because it does a few things. Well, it separates concerns very well. But what it does is the imp one thing that's really important in multiplayer game is that the model and this between the client and the server stays in sync. So having that extracted out into its own object makes that a lot easier to do than having it coupled in with other parts of the game. <laughs> um, makes it much easier to pass around. Um, and having the view decoupled from everything else is really good because it lets us do things like change skins. And that's what we do like in Zorbio, like well, in another game we made where you can have many different skins. 
Um, and you easily accomplish that by this uh, MVC kind of pattern, the MVC so, pattern. Where so you somebody could write like the, the unicorns and rainbows plugin and, yeah. skin, and then somebody else could write the uh, Tim Burton <laughs> Nightmare, My, Nightmare Before Christmas skin. Yep, exactly. And Something's and fun. not only skins, but effects too. Like oh, yeah. when, when something blows up with a skin, you could get different uh, color particles or you Ooh, have different sprinkles. colors. Yeah. <laughs> so any part of the view can be swapped out pretty much. And Cool. Um, yeah, so yeah, just so that, into that design problem too of like if the view can be swapped out, and in a lot of games, even though it's not intentional by the developer, you can still get into the DirectX API and modify the view. If there's information in the model that you don't want the player to know, but they still have it on the client, they can just add it to the view themselves by hacking it. True, yeah, I mean, then you get in, then we get into the thing about like, uh, you know how World of Warcraft has all these like view plugins because the API is open, and so I think it'd be cool to allow players to extend their own the, the UI yeah. somehow. Yeah, that'd be kind of yeah. a cool design trope, right? Yeah, that's why it's really important that you know the game that the the server is you know always validates everything coming from the client. So, um, but yeah, th so any any other questions before i move on or well i think i think the point that derek was trying to make there was more like if there is a variable if you will that the player shouldn't really know about right like you don't want you don't want it to be in the model anywhere on the client side because in theory they have access to it is that kind yeah. of what you're saying Derek? Yeah, essentially, it restricts what you want available in that model, which is not going to be the exact same as what's on the server because the server is keeping track of everything. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Those are things we'll; those are bridges we'll cross. We'll move. And you have to, I mean, right? But there, we'll burn the those client has to, to know. <laughs> the client has to know the positions of things. Like, yeah, yeah. There's, 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 it, there's the there's a core set of things that the client must absolutely know. Exactly. And then there's yeah. a lot of other stuff that the client maybe doesn't need to know, but yeah. we don't know what the client shouldn't know until we sort of get into it kind mm -hmm. of thing. It's you like it's like during see. uh it's like during um during the arcade week when we had the Red Hat arcade up, which by the way is technically public now, right? Um, oh, we should mention arcade, that. Yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah. Um when we had that up, you know, the guy that like looked at the JavaScript and we were all concerned with, you know, like <laughs> hashing and MD5 something. I don't remember right. what it was like. He just like changed the variable in the browser console and then like used yeah. the send command. It's like, oh, yeah. we didn't think <laughs> yeah. about that. Uh, yeah, you know, it free right high score. The browser and he yeah. changed it before our secure stuff. So it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He changed he changed Oops. the input into the security function. Exactly. So it's like, oh. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's in a weird way. It's like uh, like the data supply chain of the client. Like where where does somebody <laughs> perform an injection attack? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So even in games, ladies and gentlemen, you need. It's you especially need a, yeah, especially a problem with with uh, JavaScript based games, web yeah. games, because because all the source code is in the browser. Right. And you cannot you cannot avoid that. Like it's just the nature of yeah. it. Yeah. Well, um, so you have you, to you have to. There's I mean, you can probably cannot... some wacko way to avoid it that like hasn't been figured out yet. Uh, well, it's it's kind of true on any vision. game. If yeah. there's if there's a game client running, you're in you're in control of the bits. In memory, yeah. Ultimately, it's just way easier to manipulate right. them in a browser. Yeah, in browser, browser true. You got yeah. the I mean, tools right. Isn't there. that how the old uh, Oh, what was that thing called? The game genie that you'd like put between the cartridge yeah. and the console, and then you could like flip dip switches and <laughs> yep. stuff, and it would yeah, modify. Yeah, that super was, snapshot on that was magic. 64. You push the button, and you end up into disassembly, and you just go in and manipulate the memory directly, <laughs> and you could watch the assembly commands running for the copy protection check, or you know your character dying or whatever. Just and jump just past. Do, it. Yeah, you just jump past. It. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, man. Game Genie was awesome. And, and the crazy <laughs> thing about Game Genie was like, it came with a booklet of like dip switch settings, yeah, which means that some poor <laughs> schmuck sat there and like, 
what does this oh, dip switch do? All the permutations. What does this dip switch do? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there was a more strategic way of doing it, but maybe not. Maybe it was just, you know, <laughs> some people monkeys, just on, monkeys on keyboards yeah. writing uh, Shakespeare. <laughs> right. right. Oh, wow. We've gotten far off yeah. topic. No, no. I think it's totally relevant. <laughs> um, yeah. So, all right. Well, I'll, I'll move on then. So we can okay. keep going. But uh, so I just want to talk just like super briefly about the refactoring that I did on the web client yeah. uh, starting with TypeScript and Webpack. So um, someone mentioned TypeScript in chat and I also have a background in C++ and Java before I became, before, you know, I've moved on to Node and JavaScript. Um, and so when I, I was like, well, this is a good opportunity to learn, learn TypeScript. So I started by trying, uh, you know, embarking on making it into TypeScript. And at first it was, well, it was awesome. Like I was like giddy when I was like, oh my gosh, like in a JavaScript class, I can take type private on a property. Like that's insane. Like that's never been possible in just normal JavaScript. You can, you type private and then the variable name, and this is a string and you can even make it read only. It's like, and then all the stuff is, typed and just being able to type that it felt like coming home almost to like my <laughs> roots of javascript of like c plus plus and java um uh and then and then on all of the parameters and stuff and the, the other wonderful thing about it is when you import the types of all the libraries that you're using the, almost you know most editors have intellisense where you can just hover over it and it'll tell you all the stuff you need to know about it and like what is this like property that's three layers deep, like dot, dot, dot property in an object that I'm reading right now? Just hover over, like in normal JavaScript, that's really hard to do. Like you have no idea mm -hmm. what that is without. Prone. Yeah, gotten, and you just have to. Better, but yeah. still, there's a lot of problems. It works, but you the only way you can really know is by just knowing what that is. Like you have to have trust and you can look into the debugger. But with TypeScript, you can see exactly what type it is and all of the stuff about it. So so to start out, I said that was that all is the good part about it. So the negative thing about it is if you have to write a, something in a super short amount of time from scratch, TypeScript is going to – I found it to slow me, slow me down. Um, because you have to be careful. You have to make sure everything's typed. Like – and sometimes it takes the time to look up, okay, what is this function returning? And then, you know, is it actually a template of another type? And, and it take, it's in the end, it's going to lead to a much more robust and easy to read code, but it, it makes it, it, it slows it down a little bit. I would, would you agree with that, Michael? Uh, in general, yeah, I think, I think that's, true of all strongly typed languages. They, they slow yeah. you down a little bit at first, but you have a lot more assurance that your stuff is going to work when it actually runs. Um, yeah, totally. And it helps you refactor because you can, you can move your stuff around and break everything and then fix the types. Yeah. And it's probably going to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, but I mean, as a, of, as a non-developer, what it sounds like to me is TypeScript versus not TypeScript simply changes where the code blows up. <laughs> yeah. That's one way to put it. That's for yeah. sure. <laughs> um, one one yeah. thing that, that is nice about TypeScript, though, how they've implemented the compiler is that even the errors, like the uh, if if there's a type error that, that occurs mm -hmm. when you run the compiler, it shows up as an error. Um, but I by default, I think it's still, it may be a setting, but it at least used to be the default behavior. It'll still emit JavaScript to run in the browser. So even if there's a problem with the types, you can kind of, as long as you're okay with a lot of red text in your console, you can uh, implement stuff really quickly, not worrying about the type errors and have it run in browser and then mm. go back and fix the type errors. If you don't mind done it, yeah, so that's you, true. You can, yeah. you can kind of get around that, um, that slowness. Yeah. The quicksand. Yeah, I, and I think, I think it, the slowness is really amplified at the beginning when you're starting something from scratch. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and that's what I was doing. So 
I think once you have a, like a very solid foundation and you're not like all of your library, all your dependencies are pretty much set um, and working, then, you know, and your code base is, is going like, then the, the like slowness is much, well, it's, it almost goes away, I think by then. But when you're starting from scratch and you're like, okay, now I need to pull in a totally new library and start using its properties. And then I have to, look up all of its types it like yeah. it's it's multiplied when you're starting something from scratch and that's yeah. what i was running into it's, um, like the, it's like the difference between snowboarding and skiing so you can get yeah. started with skiing and kind of make it down the mountain the first time like not too bad yeah <laughs> snowboarding is no and so like the, the ramp yeah. up curve for one versus the other like one is this like sort of gradual whatever and then kind of there's a huge ramp later and the other one is like huge ramp at the beginning, but then very gradual slope kind of. Yes. It, that's a really good analogy. Yeah, totally. That's what it's like. And so you since I, I wanted to have a... sales. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, since I was racing to finish this demo by today, I like, I just had to give up on it because I was at the rate I was going with TypeScript wasn't going to happen. Not that I don't like TypeScript and I think it's awesome. It's just, I had to go fast. And so, and it's starting from scratch. So quick and dirty. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, less, and we'll probably we'll go than back the initial. to it again. Yeah. And then Webpack was the same thing. Like I, so Rhea with the latest version of Webpack does not work well. And I think I'm going to file a bug with the maintainers of that. Um, of it throws an error. Ria and re using Webpack to package up your um, bundle. So Webpack is a, a quick background. It's like a bundler for yeah. JavaScript. So it takes mm -hmm. all the JavaScript modules you're using and push up them into a big JS file right. or, or multiple. Um, you could say it and, packs them. Yes. And it also, and it also does stuff like <laughs> compile, compiles the TypeScript and uh, does Babel transpiling if you need to, um, et cetera. But um, the it was throwing an error with Rhea, and I could not figure it out. I spent like several hours, um, and finally I gave up. And I I think so, so it's a bug a, with. Go ahead. I think it's a bug with Rhea. Answer. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That, that was it's question. not a bug with Webpack. Yeah. yeah. The newest version of Webpack's pretty. Recent. I mean, you know, uh, it has a lot of changes. I think in it. So, mm. um, I'm yeah. So I will like talk to. The maintainers may all find an issue about it because it definitely is a problem with Rhea. Um, but because I need to get something working, I went totally buildless, and that's the next step. <laughs> so, a lot all the games that we've made except for one, which is Square Off, so Zorbio, Pity About Earth, Command Line Heroes Bash, all of those, they don't even have a build. They just they're just in index.html files, and we just import the JavaScript in the index file and then reference it in the code. Um, that's how this one is. Yeah, so that's what it is for now, like until we can figure out some of the bu uh, bugs of about it, um, which works great and it's like clean. It also makes me, I don't know, I feel like I feel freer when that happens because then I don't have to worry about compiling anything or doing any kind of weird like Freedom. modification. It just, it makes sense. But um, plus it's really fast because you don't have to wait for a build step. You just change a thing and it instantly is in your browser. Um, the problem with it is that ES, so we're using features on ES8, which is 2017. It had async await, and probably there were still some browsers out there that won't support that natively um, without being transpiled, I would think. Um, ES6, I think, is like universal now, but ES8 was only three, four, three or four years ago, and browsers are kind of slow to, people are slow to update. So, um, but you know, it's a demo, so I think it's fine, and all it works for all, uh, all of the people working on it anyway. We'll, um, we'll probably add a bit build later to, to add Babel to, transpile it, but. Or not. Um, so browser sync, it you know, is a nice, really nice tool where you can have your browser on one side, your editor on one side, you make. You make a change and then it instantly refreshes, which I think a lot of front enders are would be familiar with it, but it it really helps make it uh, speed up development. Um, I added ESLint to the project, uh, which is 
very good if you're sharing code. Um, it keeps keeps standards consistent across developers. So everything, and and it also finds a lot of common errors that uh, that might happen in JavaScript. Um, Static code analysis is massive and important for keeping large game code bases and really any large code base yeah. in a quality maintainable position. Yes, absolutely. Yep, and it are and you, it makes it, it. It yeah. Go ahead. Are you using um, VS Code? I'm using WebStorm. Uh, okay. Yeah, but ESLint will be. I mean, this it, it'll run in VS Code. I tested it in yeah. VS Code too. Yeah. I just it's just the VS Code it, VS Lint extension. Yeah, and it'll and what that'll do is it'll give you linting errors as you're typing. So if you use var instead of let, for example, it'll give you an error right oh, there in your browser. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> and you'll be like, oh crap, I need to change that. Um, and then as a thing, you can run to to do it um, like a, a a script that'll run um, to check the entire code base and tell you any errors. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing I want to mention about um, browser or not browser, but uh, editor plugins for things like ESLint is that they're they're awesome because they show you in a very like editor native way where the errors are to fix them. Um, yeah. But they're not awesome in the sense that most of them come kind of enabled by default. Like let's say you install the ESLint plugin for VS Code, um, which I just did. It will probably run on every JavaScript file you open, even if the project that you're working on isn't supposed to be using ESLint. And it's not so bad for something like ESLint, but it kind of depends on, like there's a ton of ESLint settings that you can tweak. Yeah. Like um, let's say you don't like the defaults, so you change the defaults to something like you, you don't want to be warned about unused function arguments. Uh, cause sometimes you can't help it if you're like, if you have a callback for some API you're using and that callback is past arguments that you don't care about, you don't want to be warned over and over about those. So something, just an example, um, it's, uh, I guess the, the short mm -hmm. thing of what I'm trying to say is that if you have an uh, editor plugin for ESLint or an equivalent for other tools, try to find the setting for it that says only use this if there's an ESLint RC file present in the project. Mm -hmm. that, that way you'll be sure that it, like you're honoring the preferences of the project you're working on and not yeah. your own editor's configuration or over your own editor's Yeah, Yeah, you wanna make sure you use the same one that the project is using, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. and uh, yeah. thanks for that, Michael. So um, the all right. So real quickly, the structure about the like how the how the code is organized pretty much um, it's pretty simple. Only you'll notice that it matches the architecture. So we've got we have a you know a directory for model view and controller. The scene and Phaser has uh, it mostly like the world is rendered by scenes. So you have a scene for your menu. And then you have a scene for playing. And then when you die and you get taken to the the game over s screen, if it's a different screen, it'll show you that scene. Um, or for example, if you were making like a adventure game and you're changing room to room, you could be changing scenes. So um, it, it helps it it helps keep things very organized. It's a very nice thing about Phaser that makes a ton of sense. Um, but that's under views. And then all the networking stuff that you guys had written went into the network directory. So all the proto buff uh, definitions yeah. are under proto. And then I made the, the AMQP game client is a network. Um, Makes sense. Yep. And uh, so yeah, that, that's pretty much. And then of course the assets. Okay, so that is it for the slides. Um, I don't know if you wanted to see a little bit of code real quickly. Sure. All right, so let me share uh, my whole screen, my whole desktop, entire screen. So I think the easiest way to make this big is just uh, put it in a terminal. Control plus. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Um, let's show, I'm gonna show the preload actually. Uh, 
So. Yeah, I was just digging around in the code and was having trouble figuring out how. All right, I'll show, start with the game pretty much. Line up with the um, I'll just say, yeah, yeah, I'll show you how the how it, how it works. So, um, so the index HTML file, like I said, since it has no build, um, and also is this font good enough for people? Yeah, looks good. For okay, so since it has no build, you have to import the scripts yourself. So we import all of our dependencies. We only have four right now. And then finally add the your first party scripts, which is the the actual game. So there's a launcher, is the index at uh, dot js. So that's pretty easy to understand. And then if you look at index.js, it's very small. All it does is wait for the window to load and then it starts a new game and it imports the game from game.js. And when you say new game, it launches the game. And then game.js. Um, oh, wait, no, that's the next. That's uh, so game.js. Uh, oh, what it nice. does. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so what it does is it starts the game. It starts the phaser game. It's very small. So one, yeah. So keeping these kind of discrete files is easy, easier to understand. So in Phaser, it just takes a config object, and that pretty much decides decides your whole game world. Um, and then once the game, oh, actually, one important thing about the really important about this is when you start the the Phaser game, you pass it its scenes. So there's a the pre and the first one here is the first scene it's going to go to, which is the preload scene. Um, and that's imported here, preload. Scene. So when you when you say you pass it a list of scenes, yeah. So it's gonna it's gonna do the scenes that are in the list in order, but that doesn't mean that doesn't preclude there from being other scenes. It adds the scenes to the game uh, container. It's it doesn't launch them until you tell it to but it will oh, launch the first sense. one the first one it will launch okay so the first one in the list it always launches and any yeah. other scenes you want to be present at initialization time need yep. to be in the array yep and then you can bounce to them easily which i'm going to show you yep. next okay so once you have them in, yeah once you have them in the container you can jump to them easy so then it'll go to the preload scene uh and this this one is responsible for loading loading the game. Obviously, it's, it's going to load all the assets, uh, do any asynchronous loading, like it loads the proto buffs. So it loads the images, loads the audio, loads the proto buffs via the AMQ game client, um, and it does all of that. It does that. It waits for that to all of that to be done. So it preload is is an asynchronous, and it can run asynchronous functions and the game won't start until all of this stuff is completed loading. Once that's all done, then it does, it calls scene.start, and then you pass it the key of the scene you want to jump to. So now we're going to go to the menu scene. And this would be like the scene that has the play button on it. Um, and you pass, you can pass arbitrary data to it, which is the client, that's the AMQ game client, and the model. <clears throat> So now we go to the uh, the menu does nothing right now. All it does is it skips to the main scene. <laughs> so in the future, when we add the the play button, you know, settings, the the title screen, the title screen of the game will get rendered here. Yeah. When we're ready there, for there it. There may be other things to do before the player yeah. gets dumped into the play mode. Exactly. <clears throat> so then uh, that's that, and then the final one is the main uh, the main play area scene and what this what this does is like a, back to the architecture is um, it pretty much just renders like it doesn't do any network stuff it doesn't do any model stuff it gets the model from the uh, you know it get it has a reference to the model um, but the model itself is getting updated by the the AMQP game client um, most, most of what it does, so it starts the, the music as the background, it, it renders the scene that we're in, 
And then here is the update function that cha that updates the player positions. Um, and it, and it does it without any knowledge of the network. It's just going over the model. The model in the background is getting updated by the the client. Does that all make sense? Yep. Oh, well, makes sense. And then oh, and then one very last thing, which which we which I was working on right before this is, the uh, this scene also right now is handling key keyboard presses, and when it gets a keyboard press, it's not going to do anything itself. It's going to pass that to the client to send the command to the server. So it's yeah, going to call so this, this function this, on the client. This function that you're in right here, this is the actual yeah. game loop function, which gets this called. is the game loop on yes. every iteration of this scene, or this is yep. the scene loop, if you will. Yep, this is the main game. <clears throat> yep. And so then, yeah, and then that, so if they press a key, it's going to send yeah. this move. So if you, which, if you scroll up real quick, yeah, again, to the iteration. So it, you can see it's, it's iterating over every player in the model yep. and essentially updating the location of their phaser body, which is like yep. where the entity on the screen is essentially. Yep. Exactly. Um, and so that's the position piece. Uh, the camera center, is that just like if you had moved yeah. the camera, offsetting it? Um, yeah. So that, and there's a couple, so we were trying to center that. Um, and I'll explain what this, what this does in when I show the actual game. Sure. But, we're trying to center um, it on the actual player. Yeah. So you were doing, you had a fixed width. So you could take the width and the height and just divide right. it by two. Yeah. Um, the camera's main center is telling you the X and Y of the very center of the camera in the inner window. So you resize it, to, no matter what size it is, that center X, Y is the center of the browser window Got of the it. game area. Makes sense. Yeah. So it makes it easier when you have a, di you know, a dynamically resizable play area. Cool. Um, okay, so let me show the game now. I uh, probably need to start the server if it's running. It looks like it's running. So you might want to restart it because okay, <laughs> like yeah, because you've got several players, and every time you restart yeah. the browser, there's a new player, and it's just like all right. So time. let's go ahead and refresh here. So so this is a full screen, and this player is getting drawn by via the server, uh, the client, and passing the model to the server, and then the client rendering the players. Yeah, can you go back to the, the server model. real quick? Yep. Oh, back to the uh, server. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're on it. Um, if yeah. you restart the server and pass it, pass it. So right now it's in verbosity one, which isn't particularly yep. interesting. So if you kill that and then add a dash e, uh, dash. Yeah. so it's going to be dash yeah. e. Uh huh. Uh, uh, log level is a capital log, log underscore level. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Log level. Two okay. four. Equal four. Yeah. Try that. Okay. And now refresh the browser. Oh, now it's now it's dumping out more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, but you'll see. So there, well, as soon as you refresh the browser and you go back to the server, now there's yeah, a player. Yeah. And so what you'll see is I added a bunch of log messages into the server game loop. Yeah. Um. Yeah, you're probably gonna have to maximize it because it, it's like super indented. Yeah. Here, how's that better? Yeah, and so we and you can kill the server if you want, or just scroll. Okay. Up. But what you can see is um, it iterates. The server iterates over all the players, mm -hmm. and then yep. puts messages onto the message broker with information about each player's pod. Yeah. And so, in your case, it looks like you ended up with three players somehow. Yeah, probably because I refreshed um, it a bunch of times. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, or we've got something weird in the in the loop, yeah. right? But basically, it says, okay. I'm going to update this pod, which is UUID, whatever. There was no yep. movement. There was no shooting. I'm going to update the timers. Here's mm -hmm. the velocity and the position. And I'm going to send yep. that out to the client. Okay, next player. No movement, no shooting. Here's the position. And so what we would see if we had the keyboard commands working, which we don't have them working. We right can now, try it. Like, I mean, yeah, let's, because let, it is I don't want to spend sending. too much time on that because we want to get to yeah. some design issues. Um, yeah. So let me just see if it. Nope, it's uh, sorry. Like... Break out of handling. Um, it says handling incoming commands. I don't know. Yeah, break break out of your server. Restart your server and go to okay. log level eight. Okay. 
because if I remember correctly, log level eight will barf out any thing it actually gets you may want to change oh, the yes. um, game loop time also to like three seconds or multiple oh, seconds uh, oh instead of sleep cycle sorry. make it 1500 or 2000 or something like that okay so that's 1.5 seconds per okay. loop which is still pretty fast so now I if you refresh two. the client all right this um, is good all right i'll refresh the client then and then if you yeah. press a button dumped out a bunch more yeah. yeah that's fine if you press like up yeah it doesn't look like it's receiving it okay which means it's either not sending it or there's some other well, it is sending it like if i so here's the the, yep. the, dev, the dev tools uh yeah wait oh, what happened well so what happened is the server died oh the server died yeah it got, it got stuck at yeah. something yeah, well, I think so when we it, left off, we didn't actually close the loop and test the input, right? Because it wasn't on the client side. So there oh, definitely could be an issue still on the side on the server side with the switch yeah. to Um but okay. So but we don't have to talk about the, the commands is like the next thing to fix. Um yeah. it is connecting, it's drawing the players. Um and yeah, it's and it's sending commands, but it's just not hitting the right queue or the server's not receiving yeah. it or something. Yeah. yeah, we had it working at one point. Now we refactored everything, and it's not Yeah, up. yeah. <laughs> so, so but, one uh, of the things we wanted yeah. to talk about was was kind of game design issues, and this is sort of a good a good time yep. to talk about it. And so, I can one try. of the challenges is um, we're using. Yeah, you can stop sharing screen if you want. Where do I stop share? Here we go. So we're using Box 2D, which is a 2D physics engine for C. Well, I mean, it's the one we're using is the C++ implementation. There's implementations for lots of languages. And one of the interesting things about Box 2D is that the universe has no fixed size. It is theoretically infinite. Um, and it, it doesn't even really have a way. You, you have to like clues your way into creating a bounded 2D space, if you will. So you either have to create a boundary and then have objects bounce off the boundary or implement some other game design trope to prevent people from exceeding the boundaries of the game. But the other challenge is like, it also has some theoretical units, but they don't mean anything in our, in our game, so to speak. So we, we sort of need to figure out like, well, okay, this is a spaceship. How, how big is the spaceship? like in the game universe. And then we have to take those measurements and speeds and other things, and then go backwards to display this in a way that makes sense. The units can be completely arbitrary. The scales don't even have to be meaningful, but we need a consistent mapping from server idea of player space to here's how we show this idea to the user experience. That was a very terrible sentence. <laughs> um, so we had had a conversation in the Discord a couple of weeks ago about like, I sort of looked through popular small spaceship sci-fi stuff. I was like, how big is the ship from Firefly? How big is the Rosinante from The Expanse? Like, how big is this other thing? And I, what was the number that we got to? It was like, the ship should be a hundred meters long or something like that. I don't, I don't remember. I Do you recall? Let me, let me see a, if I can scroll up in the discord. And actually you were saying that, that these aren't like light class fighter individual. Well, when you go the, flying, it's the idea right. that, I, that we had very, very early come out with or discussed was like, you start out in an escape pod because the, the trope of the game is it's very circular, right? Like you, you keep trying to, glom stuff onto your ship as you as you take out other players and if you get taken out you sort of end up back in an escape pod and have to start up all over again it's like groundhog so day in space what, what it's like groundhog day in space oh absolutely I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean generally we're all living groundhog day but um so we sort of need the both both extremes of the scale right like what what are we envisioning is the largest slowest like yuckiest capital ship being and then what's like the starting player size um yeah so was, you know go ahead Derek. oh i was just gonna say the uh what we had kind of talked about or what i had talked about was 300 meters to 600 meters as the range 
Um, the reason behind that, behind yeah. having that mid-level range, is that we want players to feel like their ship upgrades are substantial changes to the way that they play the game. So that right. means either we're looking at like you know fighter-sized ships or capital ships, right? And if they get too large, we'll lose detail of the upgrades visually that we want apparent from like a game design perspective. So we don't want to do fighter ships because the game is more about strategic and tactical thinking instead of you know your reaction time. And we want to be able to communicate that to players. Like the first time they plop into this game, they should be like, I am controlling a capital ship. Mm, yeah, I am okay. thinking about strategy. I am thinking about the way my ship is upgraded, not how fast can I swipe my finger across the you know phone screen or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm finding the, I found the conversation now. And yes, you did say 300 to 600 meters. Um, so I'm the captain now. Somebody says, Tochigi, can I get super capital ship? So, um, 300 meters. Okay. So that gives us one number, if you will. And we almost, the meters is almost relevant. So it's 300 units, whatever those units are. Um, the next question then becomes like, all right, well, how many players? Yes, theoretically, there's an infinite number of players in a sector, but reasonably speaking, there's a, there's a finite number of players in the sector. And, you know, if we pick some arbitrary number like 20, you want to be able to like move a little bit to encounter somebody and shoot and engage. And like, there needs to be some sort of area of play. And so if you've got 20 things that are all 300 units in size, like what does that mean the play area needs to be from a unit perspective? Like a hundred thousand like a ten thousand I, I i don't know right we, we have to pick something and kind of go with it um and i think that's where a lot of the game tuning will come into play it's like oh god it takes me five minutes to get to a player like the player is yeah too big. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah but that that is going to inform a bunch of other things like velocities right so if if the play field you know do we make the play field smaller or do we just make the speed of the ships faster the player has no idea, doesn't have to have an idea what the units are until later. They just know like, okay, I'm covering ground more quickly than I was previously because I held the button down longer. But the actual number of units that are elapsing is almost irrelevant, but we still need like unit numbers to, to sort of fudge. Yeah, with. I mean, if I were to pick a, you know, a size to start with, I'd be like 100,000 units. Um, and the reason for something so small uh, is because we have talked about this mechanic of having players drift towards each other regardless of where they're choosing to thrust right or where they're trying to go they need to move relative to other players and not necessarily at a static point in the map yeah. right so a hundred thousand units is i just did math it's 333 pl players across if you will so if you took a player and then just stacked players touching all the way across the play field that would be 333 of them um, you know, is that good or bad? I don't know, but that's the number that we'll go with for now. And then we have to sort of determine a speed, right? Like a, like a top speed of the starting unit, if you will, because theoretically we, we all are in agreement maybe that every mod you put on your ship makes you slower. You start at the top at the fastest possible speed you can have and everything you do makes you slow, either rotation yeah. or velocity or both. Agreed. And the way that I, yes. And the way that I like to do balance in games is I like to keep all numbers under 50. And if I can help at all numbers under 20, um, makes balance easier. It's a lot easier to talk about with other people. Human brains are really bad at math that goes beyond like 10 anyways. Like we, in our brains, we represent the number, you know, a hundred and the number, the number like a thousand identically, like the neurons in your brain treat them identically, except the word that you're picking. So if you're balancing around these, you know, these small numbers, it's a lot easier to talk about, a lot easier to make sense. Um, and it's also one of those things, too, where it's like, we don't need to tell the truth to the player about how fast they're going. If they, if, you know, it feels good in the game to go super fast, we just have the background move super fast and they can yeah. still move one, you know, yeah. one unit. Or, or, we change, or we change some config value in the game for how fast it's actually moving kind of thing. So, right. so from an initial dumb math perspective how long do we want it to take the player to cross the playing field from one side to the other assuming they were at top speed from the moment they started and they had to traverse the whole thing 
is that well they're seconds, never going to be able to do seconds. that right like they're never going to be able won't, to do but that we need to start to me, somewhere so it's right, like to me the answer is one right how fast does the player get to go one, one second one a sec- entire... you know one a second no no no, oh, no sorry oh, one player one unit, unit, unit per second okay so no, I, I like i like eric's framing of that like you we could choose like how long do we want it to take for a player to go at top speed from what from point A to point yeah, B. Yeah, they may never get there. One side to the other. <laughs> but we How should we have an idea of what do we want the minimum to be? And then we can scale everything relative to those two values. And we can we can call a unit whatever we want a unit to be, because it's a unit. Um, and and to to Derek's number that he threw out one unit per second, that means it takes 333 seconds to cross the playing field. That's a long time. Which top, isn't necessarily a problem, speed. right? Because you're never going to yeah. do that. It's all about fighting their players. I mean, our, the biggest thing that's going to inform all of our balancing decisions about scale and size and movement and everything well, maybe that's is the... our target our target session time, right? If somebody True. needs to be able to fight True. all the other players and move on to the next, you know, ring or whatever within a certain amount of time, it's that time that we need to play. And because this is a mobile, you know, oriented casual type game or something you're playing in a browser. That time needs to be somewhere around two minutes. No, it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing is that if we do the, so this brings up the player distribution. Um, and so I already forgot the name of the, of the distribution mechanism, but essentially I think out of the gate, if we start with an algorithm that equally distributes players around, well, see, this Optimal is where place. it's tricky. Because if you do equal distribution and you start the very first player in the dead center of the play area, then the next player equally distributed is at one of the edges, if you will, which means it takes two and a half minutes for the two players to reach each other. The first two no, players. No, yeah. I think, I think the way we solve that is so uh, I think it was like our second stream. We kind of talked, we kind of drew how the rings. The rings are concentric, but that's but, the that's the. There are many sectors that make up a ring. What's yeah, I know. Whatever. That's yeah. So in, everyone will spawn, on the outer side of on on the outer ring when they start, but the outer ring. Let me finish. So, they're all divided up into sec sections of a ring, right? When players are joining, we're not going to put. I don't think we would want to put one person on a, an outer sector on the left side and then one person on the outer sector on the right side. Yeah, I need to We want to read... kind of like, we want to fill them up to the optimal number of players per sector. So if let's say there's no one on the game at all and two players join, they should join in the same sector. Yeah, so, so pause there real quick. 100,000 units is the sector size or the game universe size? I think the game universe size. I think it's the sector mm -hmm. size. Well, no, it should be the sector size. Yeah, oh, the, the game size. universe okay. is made up of many multiple sectors. The gameplay field is the sector. The universe is something that the players may never see, or maybe yeah. they see it as some sort of gooey. Well, right? it's not and they may not even we, they may not even know about conceptually sectors because we make it transparent, right? Like a server might yeah. be in charge of a sector, but as if you end up transitioning or transiting from a sector to what, to another one, that may be transparent to you, but mm -hmm. you did so because you crossed some literal boundary that the game knows about. Doesn't mean the player knows about the boundary, just means that there is a boundary and a transition between yeah. kind of one thing to the other. So, so, so again, going back to if a sector is 100,000 units, mm -hmm. At the first two players would need to be some reasonable distance apart, and then you can go to equidistant distribution. Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, so you end up with players five minutes apart. Like out right, of the game. Yeah, we don't want that because it'd right. be boring as hell if we did that. Yeah. Well, and, and, and what are the odds of you finding that player right in a hundred thousand unit circular or square right, box? Exactly. Like, so if you start here and I start here and we go this way. Like, yeah. Oh, no. boogers. We'll never find. We just. Each other. I think we would. Yeah. I don't know. Well, well that's that's another another trope. Each other. So that's, that's why I'm saying let's get into mobile like game dollars. design. Sure. Right? Is you have 30 seconds to grab a player's attention. Yep. So they launch the game. 
They're into the menu. They join a session. That's already between five and 10 seconds. You have 20 seconds left to get their attention in this game, right? When they warp in, that should be, to me, that says you have under 20 seconds to get into range and fight another player. Yes. And to me, part of that, like, that, you know, the cycle of gameplay that you're going to be experiencing, that feedback loop that we want players into is being able to destroy another player and then move on. Yeah. So to me, that even says it's not 20 seconds. It is 10 seconds. You need to be able to be within 10 seconds of another player from joining mm-hmm. that's where you should right. on is 10 seconds away from another player so that's so that's 10 you 10 units basically 10 ship size mm-hmm. units which is 300 ish yeah. whatever's so that's yeah. three thousand. so so every player should start no for uh at around approximately three thousand units from at least one other player that's the outer bound yeah where, who's taking notes on this because it's not and the other thing we and the other I thing we want to do things. like another like that brings up another point which we've seen on almost every multiplayer game we've made um which is it's it's actually hard like when you're first starting a multiplayer game it's hard to get a lot of people connected at the same time um and we one can figure person, that out yeah like, but no ways I, to go ahead let me finish yeah so what i'm what i'm saying is is that let's say there are no players connected at all Right, and one person joins, um, and there's no players to be near to. They still need they, that. The, what what Eric was saying about getting grabbing their attention, like we can't rely only on other ga- players being connected. We have to have other stuff going on, whether it's NPC ships flying around or just stuff for them to do. Because yes, we have to. We we can't rely on another player being there. And this is what we talked about. We need to have NPC ships no matter what because we have to test the scalability, right? We have to be able to literally spin up, you know, 10 million players and throw them Mm -hmm. at this game and show that working on OpenShift. Maybe maybe we want to pay for 10 million to demo it, but we should be able to, right? Yeah, and the NPCs, like in that case, don't have to be smart, especially starting out, right? They just need to be... They just NPCs. follow a path. They, they, yeah. can, they can just fly in they circles. Really for, yeah, <laughs> That's what Zorbio does. does. That's exactly what Zorbio does. Like all those spheres flying around are just following a path. Uh, so, can you hear me now? Oh, so Roddy, yeah. my audio oh. problem was hardware mute on my headset. Oh, you had to flip the switch. Uh, yeah, I went to the rest. <laughs> I went to the restroom to fill my water, and I was like, oh, "Let me put it on mute." Wait, the button is out. Oh, I've been muted. Too many points of failure. Uh, six mute buttons. Okay, so we've got sector size of 100,000 units, initial ship size of 300 units, speed of 300 units per second to start, um, and a player distribution of 3,000 units. So I think those are good yeah. numbers to go with. Um, so now the question then becomes, what the hell do we do in box 2d to do any of that and so robbie i don't well, know if you want to share your screen and, and hit the googles but uh yeah, um, let me at. just bring open box 2d right so every every body you create in box 2d has a number of units and size that it is right and then proportionally you also have to set up its mass and its friction with like the underlying two-dimensional surface right so there's a lot of parameters there we can tweak based on size that we want, and then based upon other physics related parameters of how we balance, like how much force do we have to apply to make it move? Uh, So there's a balance to be found there. Like, how does it feel when we, you know, we have a a ship that looks like it does on the screen there now, and we apply a small force, like perceptually, we think something that big, that shouldn't, if I'm just pushing with my finger on it, that thing shouldn't go anywhere. Like I should yep. be really pushing on it hard to, to make it go, right? Yeah. So there'll be a balance to be found between yes. size, mass, and force applied with regards to like when I click a button and apply a thrust, if I picked up a thruster yep. um, and I want to move it over to the other side, like with a little tiny thruster, it shouldn't move a big ship very, very quickly. Right. right? So yes. So given that we want a maximum speed of to start, given that we want maximum speed of 300 units a second, um, 
how long should it initially take somebody to get to maximum speed? The reason I ask that question this way is this is going to back us into a force number versus our mass number, if that makes any sense. Right. Like so simple algebra, calculation right? that works yeah. out there in order to make those things yeah. happen. We'll fund all the, we'll make all the numbers configable, you know, so that we can just right. like tweak, change. And really, it's way. about what it feels. It's not about what's accurate, even though exactly. it's being physically simulated. Yeah. It's a matter of playing it and tweaking it until, hey, hey, that feels right. That's exactly what Derek was talking about, right? Yeah. So, do what do you think, Derek? How long to get to top speed? Two seconds. Well. Uh, I would say the first thing that I would want to figure out is uh, turning, like radius and time and everything. And to me, you want a, to get that like feel of a massive capital ship. It shouldn't take any shorter than four seconds by default for you to turn on your default stage. Make a three hundred sixty degree rotation. A one hundred and eighty degree rotation. Oh, okay. the reverse. Oh, so as if somebody was coming behind you, and you want to be able to turn to engage. For example. Well, assuming you had only guns in the front, right, or or, or weapons in the front, but yes, uh, <laughs> right. 100. Uh, sorry, four seconds to rotate 180 degrees, or eight seconds to rotate 360 degrees. Um, mm -hmm. But that that math and those forces can actually be completely separate from thrust force. So, like rotational thrusters versus forward like uh, accelerate decelerate thrust i think can be two totally different like uh, oh yeah absolutely if the ship has a mass of n the the force that you apply to it to get it to rotate how we want versus the force you apply to it to get it to reach top speed those numbers can be scaled independently does that make any sense yes yeah, and I would say from from that, I'm like fine with your the number. player should be able to accelerate in half of that amount of time, which puts us at two seconds. So four seconds to rotate, but two seconds to reach top speed. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if it takes two seconds to reach three hundred units per second, what is the physics on that one? What is it? Force equals mass times mass velocity. Times acceleration. Uh, is that right? I don't remember. That acceleration is 150 meters a second. Yeah, I don't remember anymore. 150 Here's units a second. So, um, okay, so we've got acceleration of 150 units per second. I need to pull up like just basics physics formulas here. Uh, physics body formulas. So, with an acceleration of 150 units a second. What is the mass? What, what do we want to choose as a starting mass number? And then what do we want to do as that'll tell us the, the actual thrust force? Are you pulling up a game physics book? What, what book did you just grab doing... off the shelf? Mm -hmm. oh, physics there you go. And it's a good one. Yeah. I have that one too. Yeah, they've been gathering dust a little while, but it sounds like I need to do a review. Force is mass times acceleration, so we just need a mass number or a mass. Yeah, and I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head what the easy numbers to work with in Box Two D are, but I mean, I would pick one for everything, right? Like easy, small numbers, wherever possible. Well, we it would be the starting yeah. mass of the ship because remember that yeah. changes to your ship change its mass. So right, if, exactly. And if we want to just use a round number and just say. 100 like it doesn't matter really because we're just going to scale the f we're either going to scale the force or scale the mass later so yeah. and, I, we... and for balance for every number i prefer things under 20 if we can help it and the visual representation is independent of those numbers that you... well so if we if we choose a mass number under 20 we're going to get a monstrous force number if we choose a big mass number we'll get a starting force number so which it's, would you rather be under 20 around. do you want force to be 20 or mass to be 20 <laughs> That's a question. What's the difference? Uh, how do you what? Starting mass should be, I think. Starting mass should be which? A low number, because that's that that makes more sense when you're right. so if acceleration when you're is, balancing stuff like the starting sure. mass. So yeah. if acceleration is 150 and starting mass is 20, that means that the initial force capacity is 3,000 mass units per unit second <laughs> like we need to pick some real 
values here. So if we stick with meters, then it's 150 meters a second is the acceleration. If we do the mass as tons, then it's 20 tons times 150 meters a second, which I don't know there what the go. unit of force would be at that point. I need a pencil and paper to actual scribble. I, there's only so much that I can like completely do in my head. <laughs> yeah. Blank piece of paper. It is a blank piece of paper. And I have a literal pencil. It's an actual pencil. Uh, so that's 20. That's tons force, and you just convert that to whatever unit you'd like to use if you want to use something else. Well, I don't know what box 2D uses sort of out of the box. Ha 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 ha. Hmm. Well, it depends on what you said. Well, if we want to stick in metric, what's a what's a ton in kilograms? A thousand kilograms? Is it a thousand? It's a metric ton versus an imperial ton. Oh well, if we do twenty metric tons. Yeah, a thousand kilograms. Huh? It's a thousand kilograms as a metric ton. So then it's twenty thousand kilograms. Is the mass, or you know, we can say twenty mg, but it's really so twenty. So it's three thousand, three thousand metric ton meters per second is the force. <laughs> There's a question: Does this work with VR controllers? Not, no, no. Well, I mean, if you want to write a client, that'll work with VR controllers. We, uh, we won't stop. You. If if there's a browser VR plugin interface thing, it could work. There is a web VR. Web right? VR, yeah. There you go. So mm -hmm. just you are, you are now you have just signed up, Mister Person, for writing the web VR client. Get to it. We'll see you in a so, moment. So Journey TV. <laughs> so here's another since we're talking about tons of ships. Um, <laughs> tons of what? Tons of ships. Yeah, no, <laughs> ship tons. Um, so I was I was curious, like, what elite dangerous ship. So one thing Elite Dangerous is really good is like having accurate scale. And their small ships start at 35 tons. 35 metric tons for a small yeah, ship. Yeah, but again, like uh, we're I mean, good good for them. Like right. we're 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 we we are still in the process of figuring out. So here's the deal. I, I agree with what you're saying in the sense that, yes, Elite Dangerous has done a very excellent job of accurate physics, you know, sort of get it, giving you the feel of space travel, suspending a little disbelief of, like, what the capabilities of physics are and the whole, like, jumping between stars and stuff like that. But that's, like, that was a design trope that they came out of the box with. Like, I don't think they backed into, like, oh, we've got really realistic sizes and whatever. It was, like, we're going to make a realistic space sim. Yeah, yeah, whatever. yeah. So course. this game is not, like, I don't think realistic space that. sim is a design trope for us. No. So yeah. we're just kind of throwing out units here to get to an initial scale. And again, I don't think we're going to expose any of these numbers to the player. Like, they'll just be literal numbers. Like, you're moving at 150. You're moving at 400. Like, what does it mean? I don't know. Who cares? Yeah. Is it doesn't matter? Like, do we even need to show them right. anything, or does the does the experience of the game tell them that they're going fast or slow? Like, I don't yeah. think we're there yet. If it's simple. So it simple. Right, back to Roddy. Now that we have a unit of mass of twenty thousand kilograms, and a force, and you know some sizes or whatever, like. Do you want to pull up some box 2D stuff so we can figure out yeah. how to like put some of these numbers in there? Yeah, it's it's not it's not difficult. Um, I just did that here, and I can now increase the font size via click and scroll wheel. Hell yeah! Option by default was turned off. Oh, brilliant! Settings. Um, let us make it as hard here. as possible to show you anything. Yes. Um, yeah, so we'll do this, and then we've got about thirty minutes. We'll go back to Derek and maybe talk a little bit about. How do we prevent people from getting to the borders? <laughs> so yeah, like so originally the stuff that was set up. If you think back to the early demo, um, essentially what we had was circles, right? Um, even though now we have like a boxy ship, but you can basically put like a circle shape in, or you can put in a box shape. 
So we'll have to update the back end, use boxes rather than circles, which isn't really a big deal. Um, but you can see here, like your stuff has More a density, like your stuff has a friction, it has restitution. Um, it's restitution. So like that's the shape. Um, and then the body definition, let's see what, what else is in the body definition, I don't even remember. Is that restitution like a bounce? Yeah. How, how bouncy it is? Correct. Yeah, I think so. Mm. That's how boxes sure, be working. I'm pretty sure yeah. that we don't want ships phase bouncing routine. off each other. Yeah. I mean, maybe we do, I don't know. One, yeah, one of the reasons, and I'm not sure if this is a, totally the reason, but I feel like we or the reason that the game client and the server don't really play well together is I feel like they should be running the same physics engine. But the, the client needs no physics because it is merely drawing what is happening. Mm, I mean, I not know. not if you want to have a good user experience if like you want to do predictive physics and stuff yeah it, it helps to have the same engine in both right but we're not there yet but that's right we're not there yet and there is a javascript really box 2d i'm pretty sure there yeah is, there is a javascript box 2D. Yeah. it was one of the first things i looked up yeah we yeah yeah and likewise in the original client the original client the c sharp implementation in unity was box 2d based mm. even though it wasn't identical they were based upon the same principles and the same structure right yeah, and I mean we'll we'll get to that for sure. Yeah, we want we will we do we want that because that's what it's going to make the game client feel smooth. If you're only relying on the server updates, like it's going to be very sensitive to any kind of lag or any kind of right. You know, because it, it, uh, it'll, it'll feel janky. Case, that's right. Yeah, and it will have work to basically polish that experience yeah. in a number of ways. So uh, Roddy, I was thinking about just pulling up the the actual um, box two D like docs. Oh sure, yeah, I've got. Uh, is there is there a box two D like editor where you can just put in inputs and like just bounce stuff around? A number of them over the years, but I don't know that yeah. any of them took off as like the official. Oh, box like a simulator editor. editor? Yeah, yeah, yeah where a, you can just. There's a number of good examples that compile and run out of the box. Um, yeah. Like with the spider that walks across the screen, all kind of stuff. You can easily right. tweak values and test things out, right? Like yeah. what I did when I was developing Giggle Water, I built like a little interface where you could just tweak the values directly and just take take the settings from the okay. GUI and just manipulate it on the fly, right? Like that's one of the reasons why things like Godot and Unity and Unreal and stuff that have GUIs are so powerful, right? So I, in an ideal world, what would happen with this game server is that it would really become a gene more generic simulation server where we'd hook, where we'd basically write a front, we'd mm. write an integration in the front end in Unity or Unreal or Godot. Godot is a great target. And we'd build a little interface there where we showed what was going on, like through the idea, through the game development environment, even though all the values were being fed from the back end, right? Um, and ideally, like, You'd have a, an interface in Godot where we say, hey, I want to launch this thing on OpenShift. We have a little OpenShift interface. Enter your credentials. You go get your display token. You drop your token in. Click launch me a box 2D simulation. OK. Off it goes. It launches the simulation. It talks back and forth and starts receiving the updates through the messaging mechanism. And it's all visual to you right there. And you use Godot to build your world. And then when it comes time to launching your game, you can check on the status of your world. You can send world updates. And then there's a world format of some sort that the game server runs. And then the game client is just basically saying, oh, this player joins. And then the back end knows what that means and what to do with regards to the simulation, right? That sounds cool, but also like very far down the road. Yes, that's also correct. <laughs> that's right. A little ways from now. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's a back test to bed the, in this case, right? Back to the box 2D docs. So right. So here's the test bed like integrated, right? So this little thing right here uh, is an I am GUI interface built in. you uh, what you're showing us is still C Lion. Uh, of course it is. I'm sharing my screen. New share. Sorry, buddy. That's okay. All right, this one okay. should be the right one. Yes. I think. Right? Yes. So 
so yeah, so like it has this little test bed thingy where there's an IM GUI plugin essentially to run your GUI, which is this awesome little native C, C++ GUI implementation, like in a couple of, I think it might even be single header, um, where you can look at your different shapes and stuff that you have and test them out and test like, hey, what does it mean if I set a force to whatever? Or what does it mean if I change the mass or change the friction, right? So there kind of isn't like a, a box 2D world editor per se, at least not that's directly with box 2D as far as I know. There may be some third party ones out there. Oh, there you go. I see Derek just dropped one in, right? Um, Sorry, where did Dick Yeah, drop? in the Discord. So like there's a JavaScript um, web demo of the same thing, right? To test this stuff out. So yeah, I don't think you can see it on my screen now because I haven't switched to a new share. But this is what Derek was just showing. Firefox Box 2D web demo. Geez, something bouncing around. Yeah, so, so the key part here that would be different for us is that the simulation happens on the back end. So we need to connect up the messaging as well, right? Because um, we're going to want something like this so that we can rapidly iterate the values that we want to update. Because we don't, what we don't want to have to do is go in and hard code some values in the game server, build a game server, build a container, rerun the game server. Yeah, but and I then think we can. Client, right? I think we can drastically. I, I like what you're saying. I think we can simplify it by like a bajillion times over. Put a flag in the server as an environment variable that says, you can tell me about yourself, player. Mm -hmm. And then put a flag in the web client for a debug mode that allows you to set yourself as whatever. So when right. you change... so that information has to be sent from the client to the server. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's another right? it's yeah, another yeah. protobuf or something. That's right. But yeah, like yeah, exactly. That's e correct. Either way, that that still is way simpler than like to me, what you're describing is like almost like building a second client. And it's like, no, just put, put this debug mode in the main client, you know? And then it's like, okay, like my player's mass is now 10,000 units and not 20,000 units. Like, right. And that's the, the simplest like, form of, of having a full blown editor built within the client. Right. right? Yeah. It's like, why, why, why do, why do an editor when we could just, we, it's like you have to do almost the same amount of work to do the editor. So just, put the editor in the client yes. call it a day. Exactly. And it's worth noting that this is how a lot of commercial game engines sort of handle it too. And that also introduces kind of that concept of like running a scripting language so you can actually change the game logic as it's running. Right. And not have to, you know, edit Using core server code. Server. Yeah. yeah. Like JavaScript. Or Lua. Mm -hmm. Or Lua, yes. Loves Lua. So that being said, <laughs> back to the box 2D docs. <laughs> uh, where, where, where do we put stuff like mass, force, etc.? So the body gets defined. I'm just trying to remember. So in this case, like you can see, create a dynamic box, which is a polygon shape, set it as a box. It has dimensions one by one. So what is F here? Is that just float because it's C? F is just a float. Yeah, exactly. It. It's just okay. it's just so it's, it's just a unit. Okay, so right? it's it's technically unitless. Yes, and I can't remember the assumptions that Box I, 2D makes. If that means, I think the assumption from Box 2D's design point of view, maybe that the 1.0 F here is representation of meter. Uh, I, it says somewhere in it. It does. Yeah. I'm looking for it. Uh... Right, so Box2D is tuned for meters, kilograms, and seconds, right? Yeah. So you can consider the extents to be in meters. And this well, is it. That's good that we've we've done everything already in meters, that's right. kilograms, and that's seconds. Right. Exactly. OK, right. so the posi a position of 1.1, 1 .1, is that a meter? Yes. So it's at one meter from zero and one meter from zero. Yes, X in the x and y directions. Okay. Yep. Cool. So where where's like 
on the dynamic body setting stuff like mass so there's the body and there's the fixture i think is how this used to work create fixture based on the ground box which was the polygon shape right but we don't have a ground box because we're in space well relatively speaking we're still a 2d shape and underneath right. the 2d shape is a plane and between the shape and the plane can be friction for example right which we would be one friction. way of handling slowing things down or maybe if you went through a nebula all, all of a sudden then you could well simulate. that would be two bodies interacting that would cause friction but yeah there's no the ground the, there's right no but you would simply fake it but you would simply fake it by saying hey you just changed the friction of the shape potentially yes, right got it yep yep, yep 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 yeah and so by default like there's a default gravity in the minus y direction right that you set right disabled yeah but it still doesn't say right and you set that on the world by default right. and like they use it here minus 10, for example, right? Which is close enough to 9.8. Right, exactly. Yeah. Right, so I saw something down below. It mentioned mass, but it didn't actually set mass. Right, so using the fixture definition, we can now create the fixture. This automatically updates the mass of the body. You can add as many fixtures as you want. Each one contributes to the total mass. So I'm trying but, to remember how this so works. So literally again. doesn't, you don't set the mass, you set the density? and something else, and that determines the mass? Yeah, I think that's, this automatically updates, but I don't know if that's the only way to do it. Because in this case, you're saying that a body has a number of fixtures, right? So you have to think in terms of rigid body physics, right? So you might have a square and that square can have a joint and on that joint can be attached a circle Right, and but the we're, we're going to start with one fixture because this is like... We are, dumb. that's right. And I'm just trying to remember... So I think you have to look at the since create this off, fixture right? docs or the, fi or the docs of the fixture. Current modules, summary management math, collision module shapes. Dynamics. Circle, polygon, edge shapes, chain shapes. So polygon shapes. Yeah, but I don't think this is... No, this is just how this the shape itself collisions. works, right? Yeah, I right? think you want the dynamics module... Sure. Right, so bodies and fixtures. Scanning down here. Mass data. It's, it's like two thirds of the way down. See it? Keep going. Yep. yep. Right. Body has a mass and a center yes. of mass and a rotational inertia. Yes. Yeah. Right, so like if we looked in the original code, which I'm not going to switch back to C line here now, but what we would see is that the way in which the force is applied is applied to the center, right? So right. because we just wanted to be handling simple movement at the time by sticks is how it started out. Like there was no separate thrusters or anything like that, right? Whereas if we had a box like this and we attached the thruster to the, like the bottom right-hand corner, there's a very specific place where that force should be acting on the body, right? Right, because if it, it's, it's, it's literally a physics engine. And That's so right. if you That's apply right, exactly. force at a distance from the center of mass, right. that influences the rotation. That's correct. With right. respect to all the other ones. And in fact, if you don't apply the force off center from the mass, off center from the center, I know that sounds weird. If you don't apply force off center from the center, you can't rotate the object. The only way to in, That's induce right. rotation That's right. is to apply force off center. Or the other thing you can do in box duty, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, is turn it, set kinematic mode on, and then basically animate it yourself, right? Because right, sometimes exact physics simulation is not necessarily desired, right? Um, so you can turn it off and fake True. it. Yeah. And then you can reorient it, like what its state is with the state that you have induced otherwise. Yeah, so it, it looks like what we just need to do is if you can actually pull the code up in your browser instead of having to worry about. Yeah. Um, are you going on either in my head? Hello? Oh, that's why. Okay. Somebody just came back to the house. <laughs> Wasn't expecting a visitor. Okay, so um, in the place where we create the pod, we would just um, uh, add a set mass on the body. Or on the you, fixture, whichever one it 
says it's the correct place. It it does it actually doesn't say oh, there's a correct place. It says you can set it on the body. Or if you want to set yeah. it on fixtures, you can so also here you set go. It on, on the fixtures. body you set mass data, right? So right. so right. So that's the thing. It can like the way we're looking forward here, like in the beginning, we can just set a mass data. We got a box, we want to to give mass. We're trying to figure out the really basics. But what's going to happen is that over time, when we pick up, let's say we're this box, we're in escape pod, we're going along, we run into a thruster. The thruster has a mass. So we are now the pod mass plus the thruster mass. Right. And the thruster has been attached to the pod in a given location, right? And right. so we can we can physically simulate all that. Yep. And at that point, we don't want to calculate the mass and the effect of having a mass in the lower right hand corner of the pod ourselves. That's what the physics simulation is for. Yeah, for sure. Right. So in the beginning, we'll set the mass data. But then yep. afterwards, once we're starting to join things together and like attach them with a certain amount, we, we of would time, let it use the derived it mass data for the That's body, right. which is the sum of all the fixture masses. Right. Effectively. That's right. Exactly. And we no, may have joints cool. in between and like the joint may be able to take a certain amount of force before it breaks. So like if, yep. if another ship came in and rammed it, you know, thrusters, the joint can break off, the thruster can go flying, yep. Makes sense. all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, what's a mass data look like? Float mass, the mass of the shape, usually in kilograms. All the right. center of the shape centroid relative to the shape's origin. Zero and the rotational inertia of the shape about the local origin. I assume zero for now. Which we would start out with zero. Cool, all right. So somebody write that down. <laughs> so it'll, it'll become obvious once we, once we go to do this and actually once we get the input connected again to make things move, like we'll need to adjust all these numbers. Yeah, because like I had been to... playing with the JavaScript of like, let yeah. me change the force. And it's like, it's still moving at a snail's pace. And I'm like, this doesn't make sense. Yeah. Right. So, so kilograms, meters, seconds. So in this case, the mass of the object is, uh, whatchamacallit, 20,000. Kilograms. We're going, with, we're going with 20 metric tons. To okay, 20 tons, right. Yeah. So. Can you go back to the game code and find where we're applying force, which is going to be um, probably in one of the updatey movie things? There's the get position. Yeah, this is That's the oh, update. okay, right there. See eight eight two vec move fifty. Bottom all the yes, way bottom. Yes, right there. DC. So is that is this the force that's being applied? Calculating the forces. So, By force to center. So I'm assuming right, so that's, that's right. a force of 50. So, okay. So the 50, I'm just thinking back to when I wrote this. So the 50 is a multiplying factor to the move and the move X and Y oh, is equals. the value. Yeah. Right. So the move X and Y is what's handed in from the client. Right. right? That was coming and in. And the original message. client was like, think two sticks, right? So yeah. each stick has minus one to positive one in each direction. Mm. Right? Well, no longer as well not no longer i'm just saying this is how this yeah, yeah. code was originally Got written it. right okay right 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 yeah so this is why so we take in yeah, the so stick you, magnitude you were and then we multiply at, by at a multiplicative full, factor at full stick it was 50 that's right exactly Got that's it. correct okay cuz so that's what actually, felt right at the time sure yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. right it's going to have to be scaled so so we would actually end up you know for the sake of simplicity to begin the game you know we're doing like some kind of wasd control W is the thrusters on, not W yeah. is the thrusters not on. Right, S right. It's either one or zero. Backwards. Right. Yeah. Yep. You know, it's suspend suspend disbelief, and you know, S is like just as much yeah. force, but in the opposite direction. Right. Like, That's right. Who knows how it works? That's just right. how it works. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's the vacuum physics rocket blaster. Um, right. No, I mean, in our final implementation, it should be a you know mouse or touch based, right? It won't be WASD, right. but it doesn't right. mean we like you click somewhere, you avoid it. it goes there and does what you want, or or it just follows the pointer. Or Probably follows the follows mouse, the pointer. yeah. Or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, how, how far the pointer is away is how much force you're applying. For us, you're gonna, yeah. No, no, Maybe totally. there'll be a little so, circle and there'll be a yeah. maximum there. Yeah, so, right? so from mm -hmm. the numbers and taking notes perspective, the force units are meters per second? Yes, I think, I think that's correct. Well, the, the force units would be newtons. In right, but a newton is just a meter term. per second, isn't it? A kilogram meter per second? 
A kilogram meter per second. Yeah, I think that's right. So if we have, tw uh, so we have to actually get this into the real units. So it's 20,000 times 150. So it's 300,000. I'm bad at terrible at small number math. Times twenty thousand. That's one, two, three, one, two, three. So that's three million. Three million kilogram meters per second. So that number is probably going to be three million. Okay. I'm assuming. For our given scale. At the current scale. Right. Of a hundred. Uh, 100,000 units, 300 units for the ship, or three. Which makes sense, right? Because if you've got something that's 20,000 kilograms, it takes, it takes a significant force to move, right, to, to, move it. to move it, right? Yeah. Yes. So, okay, so it's going to be 3 million is the force. Um, and then we probably also need to figure out um, we we may actually need to start out with a fix with a second fixture or something because in order to induce the rotation we need a different force for the rotation to get that 180 degrees in 4 seconds thing right so, to be able to test that out you mean and be able to well just to make it work like that. to make yeah. it actually function right we're going to need to be able to apply cuz right now this apply force to center quite literally is what it says apply force right. to center that's right and so to that's right it, up down right like yeah 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 yeah. and so we don't want to do that because we want the ship to rotate not um just not to move just sideways literally um so do you want to go back to box 2d and take a look at like where it would go right so you can apply to a point um let's just do a search for apply force or you can you can apply a rotational force, for example. So apply force in general means we'll probably take a vector, right? So you have a vector, which is the force and the point at which it applies to the body, right? So if you've got the square, there's a certain point where the force will apply to it in order to cause the rotation, right? So like if we pictured a pod with two thrusters, for example, and each thruster was on the bottom of the pod, for example, if you operated the left thruster, there's a force acting here and it's going to cause a rotation, right? Yeah, I think for the purposes of stupid simplicity, we want to apply rotational force right. at the central axis at the end of the ship. So 150 meters away from the center of the body and right on the side. So yeah, so if, yeah. if we think about the sausage is pointed up, yep. the center is here, this is negative 150 Y. Right. We always want to apply rotational force. If, if they're pressing left, then we apply right force at right. the end, at the butt end. And if they're yep. pressing right, then we apply it right. at the... Um, right, that makes sense. So that would be, so we sort of have to change the, um, if you go back to the code, we're actually going to have to add some different logic here because the we might have to tweak the move queue basically because now it's going to be you know both of these are are for now is the thruster on or is it off that's right which, that's correct which thruster is on okay the forward back thruster is on then we apply force to center of either a positive x along the body or a negative x Right, so essentially we'll check to see which key is down and apply the force to the appropriate location. Well, it could be, it could be both, right? We're it could be we're both, already, yeah. yeah. We're already sending yeah, that's fair. whatever, and so it's just up to us to decode right. yeah. what that right. move command actually did. Although, yeah, actually, it, honestly, I'm not even sure it may still be sending it as one key at a time, but it's sending it like rapidly in sequence. So it's right. like... Up and left and up and left. Up and left. Yeah, I think that's you know probably I mean? correct. So it's like a thousand messages of up and left. And then as soon as you let go, it's just the message. Right, it stops. Stop. That's correct. Yeah. 
Well, would is that how it would work with a pointer? Like, let me think. With a pointer, no. Like, if you had a pointer, would, we would need we'll to, to basically. You need a vector. Out. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. You have to figure out the math, and the tell vector, it where to yeah. go, and then the yeah. ship needs to figure out how to get there. Right? Yeah, which is which is why which is why on screen joystick even for mobile might be the easiest, like on screen WASD. <laughs> Right. You know, like like for, yeah. forward back with your with your you know uh, control with your thumbs and, uh, with one thumb and then it's just you know tap to shoot with the other one. Like we can start out simple and make yeah. it fancier. Cool. I think we got pretty far with our thoughts and our game yeah. design. Yeah. Tricks. I think we certainly have next steps, right? Which is the most oh, important thing. So one thing I that wanted to think back, circle back to. Derek, you had wanted a, you, or you had an idea or something like you, you're, you're never going to be able to reach the edge of the sector. Cause one of the things is that box 2D has no concept of, of size. Like the playing space is theoretically infinite unless you bound it somehow with physical borders. Um, we didn't want to Pac-Man it in the sense that if you went off the right edge of the screen, you shouldn't magically appear on the left edge of the screen. Um, and so what was your thought there? On a design that game. all players are going to have an intrinsic force applied to them that has them all moving towards each other, and that will increase as time goes on to help push those players to that. Oh, you know, in like two minutes, I have faced all other players. Yeah, and instead of having a battle royale, you know, scenario where it's like, oh, the borders are closing in on me. Oh no, it's just happening in the background automatically. It's transparent mm. to the player, the forces that are involved in keeping the game active and interesting. Oh, that's okay. So the players are being pulled toward the center. Yeah. Well, we toward got... each other, it could be just the center, however we want to handle it. Right, because if every player is around in a circle and they're all being pulled toward the center, then they're all getting close with each other. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds like an amazing design idea. It also sounds like it's really hard to implement because <laughs> it's like... We have to figure out the force to apply to every player such that they move towards every other player. I mean, or, and, or and, you change and, and they don't have the ability to move away from the other player fast enough to ever reach the boundary. Like it's, it's gravity. It's like so, you need gravity, but it needs to be centered on a point. I mean, that's. I mean, the physics engine should be able to have that, right? Like, can you so the physics have a gravity and you can and you can have a place where the gravity is, is applied towards. The challenge yeah. is if gravity is greater than the force the ship can exert, if you do nothing, you're, you pull towards the center very fast. Otherwise, you are much like a trout swimming upstream in that at best you can hope to not move in the negative direction of gravity. And so it's like so you, the, the way that I would do it is not even touch the you know physics engine, just adjust the x and y position of every single player over time very slowly. So and you would just calculate, you know, what's the distance to you know the origin, the center of the universe, and you would increase that in you know a bell curve essentially that ex would accelerate over the course of two in, minutes in, and in an exponentially and then, growing fashion. Yeah, I mean, essentially, yeah. <laughs> so I think the thing is there, I think we need to, like the physics engine has its own state with regards to what a body's position is, right? So yeah, and you do like body death top position. We you need know, body to body 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 the engine, right? Yeah, but I think we can just tell it. Like, hey, That's I what I'm saying, you have to thought... feed it back in. We've manually, kinematically updated where things are. No, no, no. I'm not either we're talking past each other or we're talking about different things. So so the the physics calculation would still apply. All Derek is suggesting is that we do some math to figure out a number which is an offset and on every game loop we just remove that offset from the player's position before the physics calculation occurs. So you were at position 100 comma 100 and physics wise your position would have moved away 101 comma 100 but because of magic game stuff 
you actually didn't even move at all. You're still at 100 and 100 because we took one X away from you. Whereas that, I think that's what Derek's getting at. So if the position changes and we're keeping the position of the physics simulation and the position that we keep for the player character in sync, then like position is an output of physics simulation based on mass, forces, and velocity and acceleration, right? Right. Physics is an positions and output. So if we intentionally avoid the simulation and set the position, we have to let the simulation know, yeah. hey, we forcefully changed this, yep. go back and recalculate everything. Uh, yep. Well, it shouldn't, well, it shouldn't require it any, any recalculation. It will, because you've updated the simulation and changed the position. So where that position Which it has is, to do on every frame anyway, depending on what hertz we're running the physics simulation at. Right. I don't know that that's Normally accurate. Normally it's an input. I think it's like, accurate if, because I've done it a few times. I've So with Box2D, this will be my third game with Box2D as the choice for the physics simulation. So I'm, I'm relatively sure. So if you, if you, if after the physics loop, you just give it a new position, it's going to re calculate the physics that seems on yeah. on the next loop through though on the next it's not loop like through a... not not on this yeah. frame on the next frame right but it's it's going to calculate the physics the it has same to, because way all the bodies on... could be different like you could now have two bodies in collision meaning that physically like if you have collision bounding boxes and they were two pixels apart and you've moved the position to be four pixels to the left they're now two pixels in collision and something forcefully has to happen there. There has to okay. be some resolution. We're actually, we're actually saying the same thing from di from different perspectives. Yes. So it's it's recalculating, or it, it is calculating the physics based on the new information, but that doesn't change. Other other than collision, it doesn't necessarily change anything about the physics calculation. And so what I mean is like. If you're traveling in a straight line with no friction and no gravity and nothing, oh right, at, at that's a velocity, true. No, that's correct. Yes. And we just yes. tell you suddenly that you're two pixels further. Nothing changes on the next physics calc. You just unless start there's from some two collision of some sort. Right, where, right, yeah. Ignoring because like, you can be hard collision or it could be right. like a friction type collision where there's a callback yep, and we're applying exactly. friction and that means yeah. you're slowing down because like totally maybe makes sense. Yeah. Maybe you moved into a marsh if you were like on a right. And you yeah, move from and, like pavement and, and to so I don't think that's a problem that it needs to do that. No, it's it just something it we anyway. have to consider. Yeah, right. No, no, no. So, so Derek, that might, that could work. What you're suggesting, just like a a exponentially a negative exponential decay on pull towards the center that is simply just we move you. Hmm. That could that could work. It's worth a shot, right? We we might. That's probably yeah. the simplest thing we could do, right? And you should always try the simplest Probably. thing you can do yeah. first. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're not changing the play field. We're just moving you. Right. Yeah. And this will be transparent to a player because their you know, ship will always be in the center of the screen, right? So to, from a player's perspective, all other ships are moving towards them in a fashion. Yes. Yeah. We... There's sort of a weird implication of an end state, though, with this trope, because well, yeah, they have to kill each other. <laughs> well, no, but what I'm saying is, like, at, yeah, at some point, at, you, some point. at some point, you can no longer allow new players into the sector, because if you just keep allowing new players into the sector, but the pull rate to the center increases over time the last player to join basically like joins and then instantly is like smashed into all the other players. You know what I'm saying? Like th there's gotta be some like, okay, no new players because oh. it's like the last person has joined and then the rate of increase towards the center slowly increases. Um, yeah. And to me, it would be like new players. At? Yeah. New players can join in like, you know, a rolling window of 30 seconds, right? right. For 30 yeah. seconds, we allow new players to join. Yep or whatever, and get into that combat within 10 seconds, right? Because they spawn, you know, 10 seconds away from somebody. Yeah, and after that though, point, they have to go into a new, a new section. The challenge there, though, is given the game design trope of every time you destroy a player, you can pick up Detritus, which makes you bigger, better, whatever. 
that means that if somehow I got lucky and smashed like four players in the first 10 seconds, I'm already at a humongous advantage to the player that joins at second number 28. Well, and just... that's where we talked about like when do we want the upgrades to happen, like during gameplay or like between sections. And to me, oh, like yeah, that, good point, good that's two birds yeah. with one stone is like in between sections while you're warping right into the next section, which is just a cue for, you know, spinning up a new section for you to fight in. That's when you get to drag and drop and add your, you know, new turrets or a new shield generator or a new laser to the front of your ship or something. Yeah. And, and if it's truly Battle Royale esque, then only the last player in the sector gets to win anything. So then we don't have to worry well, about. Does that make sense? I wouldn't say saying? so, right? Like anytime, like if you get destroyed, right, you get to win, you know, whatever you so kept good. up to yeah. that point, right, and go into the next section with it. But when you die, you're immediately warping, going to another section, which is oh, ostensibly filled with bots or players that are around your, you know, level of mass yeah, for your ship. That makes sense. We just need to you figure out. A, of Hunter. Yeah, we just need to figure out a story element that explains why. You picked up stuff but got destroyed, but somehow get to use the stuff that you picked up. You know. What I mean? Oh yeah, this is what I'm here for. We'll worry about that. <laughs> cool. All right. I think that's it for today. Anybody have any parting thoughts? This is really probably another cool one. I thought. I think um, I think we have a lot of stuff here to do work on before the next session. Yeah. Yeah. We so... got to figure out the control sending with the. Well, client. yeah. So we need to. So it sounds like the the issue on the web client is we just need to figure out why. Well, we need to figure out the communication between the client and the server. Why is yeah. it not right. moving and the player? And it could be on the server. Yeah, and then on the server side, purely, we just need to change the implementation of thrust, uh, uh, forward, backwards thrust, rotational thrust versus the messages that come in and mm -hmm. actually apply mass to the players. And yep. then the third piece is implementing that um, player distribution algorithm of you know, roughly 3,000 units apart in all directions ad infinitum kind of thing. Yeah. Some parting thoughts from me are thanks everyone who's watching the stream for joining us and thanks uh, Tony TV for all the commentary in the chat. <laughs> TV keeping us alive. All right, everyone. That is going right. to be it for today. Thanks so much. We will talk to you again next month and see you later. See you, folks. All right, everybody. See ya.